जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मु Mani Malik. Mani Malik had gone to Banaras. He is recounting his experiences to Sri Ramakrishna. <coughs> Mani Malik, a monk whom I met in Banaras, said. that no religious experience is possible without the control of sense organs nothing could be achieved by merely crying god god master do you understand the views of teachers like him according to them one must first practice spiritual discipline self restraint self control forbearance and the like their aim is to attain nirvana they are the followers of vedanta they constantly determine determinate saying brahman alone is real and the world is illusory but this is an extremely difficult path if the world is illusory then you too are illusory the teacher who gives the instruction is equally illusory his words to are illusory as a dream but this experience is beyond the reach of or the of the ordinary man do you know what it is like if you burn camp for nothing remains when wood is burnt at least a little ash is left finally after the last analysis the devotee goes into samadhi then he knows nothing whatsoever of i you or this universe the various paths to realize god shri ram krishna is giving us mani malik meets a sadhu there so many almost advanced spiritual sadhakas will be there and some a few hidden here and there and light and also will be there and the each expresses the path by which he has gone and that to be the easiest and the clearest path they need not or may accept the other paths it is immaterial but they present a particular path to which they are accustomed and they are exposed to and they know and they are practicing here he is telling that a sadhu told you may cry god god day and night but nothing happens till you control your senses now the it is like uh, self dependent the whole thing i have to do i have to control my senses i have to control my mind i have to direct i have to go the eye is insisted upon to destroy the eye the so here we see the dependence there is another path which is easier for most of the people and 90% people have to follow this path that is dependence on nature and god now i have to go 
a far off place like Kailas Manasaru or I am in the South India. I have to go to Kailas Manasaru, far off, far off. Now I can start walking. I can walk at least average 25 kilometers a day. How long will it take for me to go? How much can I carry my materials? It's very difficult to now I can reach, I will reach, it may take many, many years, doesn't matter, but yeah, I'm going to reach it. But there is another way. I, my own efforts, a little forces of nature, how they are working, if I try to understand, oh, I walk. But, but I have seen some balls like stones and all pebbles rolling freely in the downs. How the street is down, keep a ball or a stone, rolling stone, it simply rolls. When this rolling he sees, oh, there is a force which is working in the nature which I can utilize. Can I make a wheel and sit over that? He makes a vehicle that small cycle. If he uses a cycle, one ninth of his energy is saved. He can travel nine times the distance in the same time with the less energy. And suppose now he is utilizing the forces already working in nature which reduces the resistance of movement. Now, can I use something else which can make me go faster and make my efforts less? Now, I make a uh, petrol engine and make, attach it to my own school uh, cycle. Then I am utilizing in cycle my own driving, my own efforts, but the efforts are less compared to my walking. Time is saved, nine times. So when I use, utilize the not only working forces, but also resources of nature, it is energy is totally given by that petrol I am going to use. My only driving is mine. Efforts are not mine. Now I use that motorcycle and I see nine more times I can faster, I can go than cycle. So how much of time is saved? Nine into nine. So much of efforts and so much of time is saved. I go very fast. And in case I am able to make a aeroplane, I can go still faster. Within half a day I can reach that. Whereas years it takes me for walking. This is the in Bhakti school we utilize, we, we surrender. I can't control my senses. I can't control my mind. I offer myself to you. You do. I am utilizing the forces of nature and will and power of God to transcend. So this makes me move faster. So here all other obstructions, now I have to walk. There will be forest, there will be animals, so many dangers, so many things I have to face. Every bit, every step I have to see, I am safe. But when I go by a two-wheeler vehicle, run by a petrol, I have a lot of energy, time, and more safety. So these things will make a great difference. Now, Advaitic way who says, who thinks the world is not there, the world is Maya. Uh, other person thinks, world is God, nature, 
Mother Nature is there, one day existing as many. She has made one appear as many. And I can hold on to that power which is appearing as many. I can appear, hold on to the divine which is inseparable part of that power. So these are the ways where I am safe. Now suppose I stand on my own, I want to meditate. I want to bring the senses of con under my control. See the mind, mind is such a wild thing, it refuses. And if you force a little, it will enter into sleep. I want to sit for meditation, it enters into sleep. Or it takes dull nature. Uh, it becomes like uh, eyes. Now, in meditation we see usually various type of obstruction. First thing is kashaya. The mind is uh, associated with some thoughts. Somebody has told something, somebody has scolded, some views of a cell phone he has seen which is making the mind dirty water muddy water you can't see the bottom it's constantly it's called weak shape it's constantly then another is the water is clear but wavy it is because of the wavy you are not able to see Constant waves are going on. And you can't see. Kashaya Vikshepa. The muddy water is called Kashaya. The wavy water is called, it is clear, it is not Kashaya, it is not clear, it is clear, but it is wavy, Vikshepa. Then the, it is immediately, the first beginning itself, obstruction is Nidra. The moment I see, slowly, the, remove the ideas from your mind, try to subside the uh, thought waves, it enters into natural tendency to enter into sleep. Removal of the worldly thoughts makes him enter into sleep. He cannot shift from the worldly thoughts to the divine thoughts, awaken from within instead of being awake to the outer world. He doesn't know, he cannot do, because it is not in his nature. So the third thing is, the, it becomes like eyes. Oh. In uh, Nidra is like a darkness. Water may be clear or unclear, or it may be wavy or anything, it is just darkness is there. Because of the darkness you are not able to see anything, even water you are not able to see. Your mind existing also you are not able to see. Mind is turbulent, mind is dirty, mind is in darkness, you cannot see the mind also. Next is it is becoming like eyes, you can't see the bottom, it is mood. So, Nidra, Kashaya, where the water has become muddy, Vikshepa, where the mind is turbulent and wavy and the, it has become Mudha, just like ice, its simplicity. Neither God nor world. So, these four, how to cross over? Unless we hold on to some other power, which can lift me from there. Here, only two things that help the man to come out of it, intense activity, rajas, killing the tamas. These are all different ways of tamas. All the four, nidra, kashaya, vikshepa and muda, all the four obstructions to meditation, to go inward, to take up the inward journey, these four obstructions, our manifestation of tamas. To destroy this tamas is activity. The rajas. Rajas destroys the tamas and sattva replaces the rajas also. 
So first we hold on to rajas, the intense activity, go on working, working, working and calling on God silently, simultaneously. What happens is, my, I am exposing myself to the divine and seeking the help of nature to make my journey possible, to make my, I all remove the obstruction, you remove the obstruction. So in activity, I am interacting with nature, I am calling nature, my intention is to cross over and go. There, there is no compromise with the goal, but I am engaged day and night into intense activity, giving all attention to things, just to make nature enter into me and start working and with her power. The second is divine, divine to participate in my life, reveal yourself to me. I can't find you out. You reveal yourself to me. This Maya, the Maya concept comes here again. World as Maya, but Maya Disha is there who can trans take us beyond the Maya. Ma meva ye prapadyante, Maya me tam tarantite, Ma meva ye prapadyante. Those who surrender to me alone, transcend. The, here again I have to um, travel up to Kailas Manasarovar or walking, walking, walking. I don't know I am going to reach or not, my life continues till there or not. So many dangers, so many pitfalls, so many obstructions. A huge river comes into, I can't try, um, swim over, I cannot cross, I have to go across in the, it's uh, a bank, walking, 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 walking. Where is the end? Uh, it may take in the exactly opposite direction again. So, the, it is endless. Obstructions are so many endless. Just depend upon nature. Engage yourself in activities that help others, not for me. I don't want anything in and through the activity. I love others, I am one with others, I work for others, I work for God, I want to realize. So here the easiest path of bhakti is presented by all saints. Do you understand the ways of, the views of the teacher? To see, see here, Sri Krishna is not denying or opposing him at all. He is not telling he is wrong also. Hmm. Do you understand the views of teachers like him? According to them, one must first practice spiritual discipline, self-restraint, self-control, forbearance and the like. Their aim is to attain nirvana. They are followers of Vedanta. They constantly determinate, saying, Brahman alone is real, world is illusory, this aspect. But it is extremely, it is an extremely difficult path. If the world is illusory, then you too are. The teacher who gives to and the words of, his words too are illusory as a dream. But this experience is beyond to experience that. It is told everything is illusory. I am illusory. You are illusory. Everything is illusory. Uh, the Guru Shisha Samanda is also ultimately illusory. One exists that never was two. All right, but when will you experience? How will you experience? Hmm. Yeah, but it is extremely difficult path. But this experience is beyond the reach of ordinary man. We. Or why? I, at will I am able to renounce anything. At will I am able to concentrate. At will I am able to enter inside. Such people alone can attain. Uh, a person who is not attentive, who is not inwardly awakened, who is not able to 
lose himself in one thought. He can't reach. It is, he is not an ordinary man. If you burn camp for nothing remains, the wood burnt a little remains. Finally, uh, go on searching for that eye. Where is this eye? What is this eye within? Go on analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. Finally, you see that, neti, neti, this is not the, this is not Brahman, this is not Brahman, this is not, whatever comes to my mind, go on denying, denying. Finally, what remains is the reality. Padmulochan was a man of deep wisdom. He had great respect for me. Though at that time I constantly repeated the name of Divine Mother, he was the court pandit of Maharaja of Balwan. Once he came to Calcutta and went to live in the garden house of Kamarhati, I felt a desire to see him and sent Riday to learn if the Pandit had any vanity. I was told he had none. Then I met him. Though a man of great knowledge and scholarship, he began to weep on hearing the name of Ram Prasad's songs. We walked together a long while. The conversation with nobody else gave me such great satisfaction. He said to me, give up the desire for the company of devotees. Otherwise, people will all, all people of all sorts, sorts will come to you and make you deviate from your spiritual ideal. Once he entered into a controversy by correspondence with Utsavananda, Vaishnava Charan's guru. He told me an interesting interest. Once a meeting was called to decide which of the two deities, Shiva or Brahma, was greater. Unable to come to any decision, the Pandis at last referred to the matter to Padmulochan. With characteristic, characteristic guilelessness, he said, How do I know? Neither I nor my, any of my ancestors back to the 14th generation have seen Shiva or Brahma. About the renunciation of woman and God, he said to me, One day, when you have, when have you given up those things, such distinctions as this is money and that is clay are outcome of ignorance. Hmm. He said to me one day, why have you given up those things? Such distinction as this is money and that is clay are outcome of ignorance. What could I say to that? I replied, I do not know all these things, my dear sir. But for my part, I cannot relish such things as money and the like. So, this Pandit, whom Sri Ramakrishna is admiring here, the main characteristic is with all knowledge of various aspects of God, his tears flow on hearing the name of God. That is the sign where a, the right knowledge of not limiting God is there. A Dvaitin says God is Dvaita alone and not Advaiti. The other person, Advaitin, says God is Advaitic only, he is no more, there is no duality in God. But these people who have known, who have entered into the inner uh, apartments of God, they accept everything. Oh, 
God is limitless. He is everything and beyond. Whatever you can think of, He is that and beyond. And He can manifest as the devotee wants in His own way. So, limitation, the first and primary definition of God is He is unlimited. Don't limit Him by any means. Don't say God is this alone and not that. He can be anything, He can be everything, He can be beyond also. So, limite, where there is no limitation, where there is no um, uh, restriction regarding God's understanding, that is considered as the highest. So, Sri Ramakrishna is admiring him for that aspect of his with the supreme knowledge of the Brahman, whether realized or unrealized, at least by understanding through the scriptures and of the from the people who have known of it, he understands he has the same amount of devotion at the feet of God. As much knowledge of God, so much devotion he has got. Three aspects of existence we must possess. One is the intense love for God. The other is the unchanging eternal existence of God. The Advaitic truth as the basis of our existence and sadhana. Then the devotion to God, love of God and service to the humanity or service to this world and to nature, love of nature, service of nature. These three must go together and of course if the everything goes on well and if you can understand the aspect of the fourth yoga, the Raj Yoga of mind control and all that. But it is uh, a not a compulsory aspect of sadhana. Mm. That is a, something like what you experience as you go. Chitta vritti nirodha is what you are going to experience as you go ahead in that path. Three things we have to hold on is the one exists everywhere, as many. That is Advaitic truth on which wherever something bites, something hurts, then I can revolt, revolt, go back to revert to the true eternal truth, unchanging reality, the Brahman. Then the beautiful edifice of bhakti, devotion to God, ecstatic love of God, and the third is intense activity for the welfare of this world and people. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastur